Uh, this barn event. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, this is about my fish boat project, which is something I started in 2009. I'm a patent attorney, and a lot of patent attorneys are closet inventors. And um, I came across um, a problem in engineering of attaching the propeller to a boat and the basic physics that are involved in that and how you optimize that propeller boat connection and learned about some of the compromises they have to go through to put a propeller on a boat and like if you want the most efficient propeller possible you get the biggest one possible for your hull and you get the engine in a straight line with the propeller and so you have this enormous propeller engine in a straight line it's starting to sound like a tugboat because those are um, very highly optimized boat and propeller combinations. Um, Any time you put a bend in the drive shaft, you have a constant source of um, drag on overall motor efficiency. And so you want to avoid those bends, have this straight line. Um, but when the propeller gets bigger and bigger, the hull, the hull shape starts to distort because you've got to keep that propeller down in the water. And um, so you wind up with um, very curved hulls with a um, very large propeller, and those aren't practical for a lot of uses. They don't go very fast. It's not a fast hull speed. Um, and most pleasure craft, they plane, they do all kinds of crazy things. Even if they don't plane, um, you don't want to hull that shape. And so uh, marine architects have to go through a set of compromises to get the propeller on the hull. And the maximum motor efficiency that you can get with a propeller on a hull is on the order of um, 70%. And that maximum efficiency is achieved at a very narrow range of speed. So here you can see in this graph, the red is the um, efficiency of a propeller on a tugboat. And you can see it achieves its peak efficiency at a very narrow range of speeds. And you go faster or slower than that range of speeds. And the efficiency drops off uh, in a nonlinear fashion, looks like an inverted parabola. Um, and in contrast to um, the propeller, and I should mention that um, this is a highly optimized situation, achieving 70%. More typical is less than 40% efficiency and often quite a bit lower. Like if you have impellers on a craft, the impellers are incredibly inefficient, uh, like on a jet ski. Um, uh, the, when you're pushing a boat or when you're pushing any craft through um, a fluid, including aircraft, um, you're trying to accelerate thrust fluid opposite the direction that you're going. And the thrust fluid in the boat is water. And so you want to have um, your choices with the propeller. You can have this very large, very efficient propeller or a smaller propeller that's turning faster. And when you have a smaller propeller turning faster, you wind up with more more friction connecting those two boundary layers between the moving uh, thrust fluid and the um, stationary uh, background. And um, that's part of the reason why you want the largest propeller possible is to move a larger volume of thrust fluid more slowly rather than a smaller volume of thrust fluid more rapidly. And whenever you try to push more thrust fluid, or excuse me, less thrust fluid more rapidly, you wind up with uh, basically more friction. Um, the motor components tend to be um, involved more friction too, but the, there's a basic friction problem between the um, the thrust fluid and the surrounding um, <coughs> medium. And so on, on typical watercraft, it's less than 40% efficiency. You can, you can get this peak efficiency of 70%, and again, at a very narrow range of speeds for um, uh, peculiar craft hulls, like you have in tugboats. And in contrast, um, the green and yellow and blue lines there are efficiency curves for um, cetaceans, or in this case, marine uh, mammals. Uh, whales, and um, that efficiency
frequency curve is on the order of 85 to 95 percent and it's very flat and so when the the animals go faster or slower they have a linear change in the amount of effort that they have to put out not a nonlinear change the problem though is how do you connect okay so the problem the um, engineers figured this out in the 80s and they're like hey wait a minute fins are so much more efficient why couldn't we use a fin to propel a boat and uh, MIT came up with a number of designs they're not the only people actually there's a pretty serious cottage industry of um, inventors in this space um, and they were able to achieve uh, like the MIT Proteus craft. It's a, it looks like a container ship and it has two fins on the backside. Um, and they were able to achieve very high efficiency for the pro final propulsive force that's being transferred from the fin to the water, but they didn't have very good efficiency from the motor to the fin because they had a lot of parts and parts are bad in a marine environment. This is my refrain, but it's true. Um, even the simplest designs for um, a fin and a motor connection if you have a, um, a if this is the back end of the boat and you've got a fin coming off of it and a rod going down and the fin is connected to the rod and a lever arm and you're just yarding back and forth on that lever arm here you've got um, two asymmetrically loaded bearings which sounds trivial but those are your main load bearing bearings both of them exposed to the water they're asymmetrically loaded um, those are an expensive component for the overall drivetrain if you're competing with tugboats where they have a totally straight drivetrain and uh, very simple um, and so the efficiency that uh, MIT and others were able to get with their fins has never come close to the 85 to 95 percent um, they've also done a uh, robo tuna. It's like the classic example of a robot fish, and it's uh, very highly optimized, very efficient in terms of um, uh, work at the fin into the water and transferring the work energy, but not very efficient in terms of overall motor efficiency when you factor in the motor connections and the hundreds of parts that are involved in the robo tuna. Um, and so this was the, a problem I learned about in 2009. And my first thought was, well, I'm going to stick myself and connect myself to the fin because um, you could, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars on fluid dynamic studies and um, a, you could spend a lot of money, which I don't have, on all kinds of studies. Um, and I thought, well, if you connect your body to the fin, you're going to learn more quickly just being physically attached to it. And uh, my first thoughts were, I'm going to make this large um, J-shaped displacement member here. And um, you stand up on this platform, and you would oscillate on the platform. And my thinking was that the engine and the tail fin are locked in an oscillatory relationship and so the engine and the tail are both oscillating and a lot of the previous designs of this at the MIT and others they're trying to cancel out the oscillations of the fin on the boat like the Proteus craft has two fins instead of one because when you put one fin at the back and you yard on it, you're going to have the boat going the opposite way of the fin. There's going to be a reaction against the motion of the fin. And so to eliminate that reaction, MIT was saying, well, we'll use two of them. And I don't like that kind of answer because that's twice your parts, twice the frontal area of your drive components. And so um, I was like, well, the engine and the fin are locked in an oscillatory relationship. And so I thought, maybe this J-shaped um, beam and you're standing up on this platform and oscillating up and down and those oscillations would be communicated out to um, the tail and um, it says I got 240 left on the video yeah this is Billy Reeser um, it was a funny craft um, Primarily where the thrust was, was coming from was not the fluke at the end, the t um, but a smaller set 
of wings at the front because I realized when I was hopping up and down on the front, primarily I was making the front end of it bob up and down, not the tail end. The fluke was a very good anchor against that. And um, uh, the other big problem of this craft is it was very unstable. You're standing up on a platform and um, the stability is offered by the outriggers there, but it was still very tippy. Um, I flipped the craft a whole lot. <laughs> Um, but surprisingly, I mean, it, I don't know, it would go about a mile an hour and it wasn't very hard to do um, when it wasn't flipping over. Um, but the stability issue um, was a problem and I realized, okay, to get around the stability issue, I've got to get myself low down inside the hull. And so on this, on the fish boot, as I call it, you stand inside the hull and it has outriggers still, but they float separately from the craft um, and they are there to keep the craft vertically oriented and um, it has a big tail on the back end like before um, here's me out in the one person fish boot um, and the stability is better um, it was no longer just going to tip over willy-nilly. Here you can see the, um, the, the fluke there. I've got it attached with string on the outrigger. So when I um, rotate the outrigger, it's uh, pivoting the tail from side to side. And um, I should, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm back up for just a second here. Um, when I get in, watch the, I like the outrigger. The outrigger is floating separately from the body of the craft um, so that the outriggers aren't digging through the water as you're going along. That was another problem of the first fish boot is the outriggers are down there digging through the water as you're trying to move along. And on this one, the outriggers are free to float up and down so you can minimize the amount of uh, displacement that's required. Um, in just a second, the scene will jump and you'll see me moving across the side and it's kind of bizarre. All I'm doing to generate thrust is I'm tipping forward and back and then that's causing the fluke to go up and down in the water and um, that's the, the fluke. Um, when I first made it again, like the first one, I had a, a wing in between my legs and I thought there might be a jumping component as well. I wasn't sure exactly. But um, as I experimented with it, I realized all the, the thrust was coming from the fluke in the back and not much from the wing. So I took the wing out and was just relying on the fluke. Um, and so, which was reasonably successful. It's an odd craft, um, the fish boot. Um, and it made me think, okay, so all I'm doing is getting the boat to rotate about the center of displacement, which on a typical wing section is one third back from the, the front. Um, and I'm rotating the craft just by tipping my weight forward and back. And how could I get a mechanism that could produce that same rotation um, without a whole bunch of parts? And um, I went through, there's some, there's some book in engineering, it's like uh, 417 mechanical movements or something like that. And um, it's a classic tome, engineers use it all the time. I went through the whole thing and looked at all the different um, mechanical connections and all of them had too many parts. And um, I didn't like them and it, it was on my mind that it was somewhat like a seesaw in there and um, it was in the course of thinking about the seesaw that I came up with what I call a torque reaction engine. This is um, uh, my first experiments with it. Here in this picture, um, I'll lay the, the scene a little bit. There's um, an electric motor there in the center. It's an outrunner style electric motor where the stator is in the center and the rotor is a shell around it. Um, around the rotor, I have wrapped lead foil um, to give it a, an inertial mass. Um, and the motor 
and the inertial mass um, are bonded by the stator just to the um, center of this frisbee and I've got the batteries and the electronic speed controller in there um, as well and it's floating and you can see I'm just using a radio control um, to change the direction of the rotation and um, it's causing the frisbee to go back and forth which was is the type of motion that I was getting with the fish boot and tipping my my body um, but here with a machine with only one moving part and the one moving part is supported by entirely symmetrical bearings so I didn't have um, uh, the problem of asymmetrically loaded bearings or um, connecting rods and all the, you know, blah, blah, blah that can go with um, lots of parts that you wind up with when you try to duplicate a vertebrae um, and muscles. Like, we don't have those. Um, so my first run at building a fish boat, um, this was starting here at the in the lower left-hand corner. You can see the um, Outrunner style electric motor. That's a lead shell around it. It sits down in this cavity. The stator goes into that um, little coupling. Um, this was kind of fun. It was my first test of the dry land training. A fair amount of that turns up, and um, you can see it goes pretty well. Um, and what's interesting is it has that, that, I call it a torque reaction engine because you're um, driving it with the torque reaction on the stator. Um, and the torque reaction occurs even when you take your finger off and it's just spinning down. It's like it, you get a torque reaction when you're applying power and you get a torque reaction just when you let, let it go and let it spin down. Um, these are some videos of air tests. Um, here I've got the um, wooden craft, which um, I made the hull by um, um, making a 3D model in SketchUp, and then I intersected the SketchUp layers with, um, I forget, like 1 16th inch layers um, of wood. I found some wood that had the, that dimension and um, intercept, intersected my SketchUp model with these layers. SketchUp would let you pull those intersection lines out and print them to a PDF, and then I got a friend of mine with a uh, laser cutter to cut those sheets of wood, um, and they came out very precisely. I was very happy about it. Um, it stacked up very nicely to make, um, you can see the, uh, the result there. Um, I did a similar technique actually on the fish boot. Um, only there the layers were much bigger um, on the order of one inch thick and I just used um, insulation foam. On the first time I made the fish boot, um, I printed out the PDF on paper. Um, you can go to you know the um, Kitsap repro graphics and they'll print um, very large format paper. And I printed out on paper, laid it out on the um, pink insulation foam, which I got down at um, Pro build and um, cut it out. It was kind of messy. Um, so the second time, actually, in the two person version, which I've got outside, um, I found a um, marketing company in Seattle with a machine driven cutter and they'll cut foam. So you bring them the foam, you bring them the PDF, and they'll cut the foam corresponding to your um, PDF and the layers just stacked right up and then um, sand it lightly to get the right shape. And then um, I took it to a fellow, uh, Chris Henderson over in Seattle who does uh, fiberglassing. I do a fair amount of fiberglassing myself now. But um, on a larger thing, it's like worth $1,000 to pay Chris to do a, a better job of it than I would. So kind of similar um, technique on the small craft, but um, a much smaller scale. Um, actually, I'm going to go do it again on making a new fluke. I've got a, the fluke. I'll show you it in a minute outside. Um, the fluke I've got is, uh, well, whatever, I'll show it to you. I'm going to make a better fluke, I'll put it that way, um, using this technique. Um, so there was the first one. I, had, I dipped it in um, 
uh, Plastidip, is that what it's called? The, you get it at Ace Hardware for <coughs> dipping your pliers in to um, make handles. Oh, yeah, sure. And um, I don't know, I like the, uh, the look of it. This first one, um, I'll show you here its first free swim. The first one um, had a bollard pull, which is when you put a scale on the shore and you have the boat pull on the scale. That's called bollard pull. They do it with tugboats. Um, they do it with other craft too, but you do it with a tugboat. Um, and the, this first one had bollard pull of about three grams and it had a speed of about 0.28 miles an hour. Um, which uh, not very good, but it's also not using much power. Um, it was using 15 watts of power at the motor, uh, 23 watts overall. Um, there was about eight watts that were used by the Arduino electronic speed controller and the power measuring um, circuits, which actually Nathan um, designed and has uh, been a great assistance to me on the electronic speed controller um, components. So this was the first one, which, you know, actually, I was very happy with it. Um, a number of fun things that worked out well in the design. I used, um, it has this harness, and um, I used snaps like you have on a shirt to connect the, the harness to the body of the craft, and those worked great. In fact, on the second one, I didn't use snaps, and you'll see that one of my connection points is kind of funky, and um, I'm going back to the snaps anyway. Um, so there was a first one. Um, somewhat primitive. Uh, some shots from below. There's the bollard pull measurement. Um, so now I've got the second one. The second one, um, I've 3D printed it instead of um, doing the layered approach. Uh, a little bit more money, but it, you get a much nicer uh, end result. Um, this was a little dry land training. Um, the motor is bigger now too, and instead of um, the physical proportions of this motor are nicer as well, it's uh, flatter and wider instead of being um, tall and narrow like the first one. Um, and you can see up here, it's got an inertial mass on it still. Um, here's a close up of the tail. I 3D printed a uh, mold that I poured the urethane into um, for the tail. Here's an early run. Hi. <laughs> That's all right. This was an early run. I didn't have the boat um, submerged. It's at the surface. Um, um, nonetheless, I was very happy with it. Um, this particular video shows two different um, forms of the speed control, um, which Nathan can get up and talk about, I'm sure. But um, on this first version, the inertial mass is actually changing direction. So it's going first clockwise and then counterclockwise, clockwise and counterclockwise. On the second one, uh, when you're looking at it from above, the um, motor is only spinning in one direction, and it's speeding up and slowing down. And you get the same torque reaction on the stator, but now the motor is only going in one direction. And it's easier for this particular electronic speed controller to control the motor when it's doing this um, because it gives back EMF to the electronic speed controller when the motor is spinning at speed. When the motor is stopped, it doesn't give any back EMF. And so when it, if it's reversing and going back and forth and back and forth, the motor is spending a lot of time at a very slow speed. Um, so for this uh, relatively simple motor um, and ESC combination, the um, having the motor spin in only one direction is a much better way to go. Um, this was an early trial here. I'll skip that and head straight to this this shot, which um, 
Now the craft is going about 0.8 miles an hour, maybe even one. It's, um, it was going pretty well. The bollard pull is 25 grams, so up from um, up from two and a half to three grams to 25 grams. Um, and the power use is now a total of 25 watts instead of a total of 23 watts. And again, that includes the um, electronic speed controller, Arduino, and power measuring um, components. Um, so just a bit more power use. I've gone from 23 watts to 25 watts, and the bollard pole is now um, uh, 25 and the speed is close to one mile an hour and um, that ratio actually of power for bollard pull of about one to one is um, about what I get from a very nice uh, tugboat um, a small radio control tugboat um, that's using about 90 watts and produces about 90 grams of bollard pull um, so, and that's for a, um, this comparable boat is um, actually very well designed. They have a cork nozzle around it, which is a component they put on tugboats to increase the bollard pull. Um, and it has a very nice hull shape, totally straight um, drivetrain and a very large propeller. So it's a, actually a competitive um, comparison. And there are a lot of things to improve still. Um, the tail, for example, needs to be improved. Um, the motor, this motor is built to take, um, uh, I don't know, two, two to 300 watts. It's like a big motor you can put in a, a plane or a radio control car. And the motor efficiency for electronic motors is much better when they're matched to their power supply. And so here, I'm only giving it um, an average of 25 watts. It's actually a peak at about um, uh, 50 because the, the power curve for the motor is uh, cyclic. So when I say 25, that's um, the average because part of that time it's actually um, not using any power at all or it's actually generating a little power and the other part is um, accelerating faster. Um, so in any event, I need a, a motor that can take about 50 watts instead of one that can handle 200 to uh, 300 watts. Um, and so that would be a, a significant improvement on the overall efficiency. So, 